Hello there, and welcome to Extreme.TV's review of the Evercade game, the Atari Collection number one. And as we pop this open, inside we will see the Evercade cartridge, along with the instruction manual, which we'll get to momentarily. And we'll pop it into the Evercade, as we see here. Slots in nice and neat, and we power on the system there. See the reflection there of the webcam, but still. Boom, Evercade. Following our review of the Evercade's Namco Museum Collection 1, we're diving back into the retro-themed handheld library, the Atari Collection No. 1. This happy little cartridge features an impressive collection of 20 games, including this cart's big hitters, Centipede, Asteroids, Adventure, Tempest, and Missile Command. Now one thing I didn't mention in the last review is that each Evercade game comes in a small plastic box and with it, and what's quite a rarity in modern games, it comes with an instruction booklet. And as we can pop out here we see that we have the instruction manual and it covers each of the games, it's in full colour, but you only get about a page, sometimes a little less than a page, maybe half a page for each game. The booklets don't feature anywhere near as much about each game as the original releases of each game would have back in the day, but they are nicely presented and functional. So it doesn't give you everything that you'd get in the classic releases versions of the instruction booklet, but it's still nice because you don't get physical instruction booklets often with video games nowadays at all. Now back to the cartridge, the first game to look at is Adventure. For those of you who are interested in playing through historical video games, you can see the roots of such games as The Legend of Zelda in the game Adventure. In the game you play as a square, or at least it's a square that represents the player, and you move through a maze of screens, much like in The Legend of Zelda, and you can pick up objects such as keys or swords, which you can use to aid your progress through the game. Now there are a few dragons and a pesky bat which hinder your progress, but the good news is that they're easily dispatched when you pick up the sword. The game is all about learning the route through and can be completed in admittedly just a few minutes, but for added replay value you can choose between three difficulty levels which remix the game in various ways. Now, from Adventure to Aquaventure, where you play as a scuba diver who swims around and shoots harpoons at fish. The fish come at you at various speeds and you collect occasional items to meet up with mermaids and complete levels, all whilst battling against the clock as your oxygen quickly will run out. The animation of the scuba diver is impressive as they continue to paddle their feet throughout the game, but the rest of this is fairly simple graphically and that's very true of the time. It's a fun little game which is addictive to play over and over and certainly the game is benefited by using save states to progress so that you can go deeper in the ocean without having to start from scratch every time. Next up is another of the more well-known games in the collection with Asteroids from 1981. In this game you control a spaceship represented by a triangle that you start in the middle of the screen with and your goal is to fly around and rotate and aim and shoot all the surrounding asteroids. As you shoot one it will break into smaller pieces and once you've obliterated all of the pieces and cleared the screen you'll be instantly on to the next stage. One annoying thing about this though is, and you will learn the hard way, is that if you clear a level whilst on the left or the right of the screen, you'll instantly be surrounded by as many asteroids as you were when the previous round began. And you have little chance to avoid doom, so make sure you stay in the middle. Asteroids is one of those legendary games like Tetris, Donkey Kong, Pac-Man, or of course, Space Invaders, which is such a simple concept and is just as much fun to play today as it was decades ago. Unlike so many modern games, which are getting increasingly complicated, the concept here is just shooting lasers from the spaceship to blow up asteroids before they hit you and blow you up. It's an easy concept and it still works. Canyon Bomber is an example of filler that you do find on these cartridges, an overly simple game which would struggle to be seen as a worthy free-to-play game on smartphones these days. 
The idea is that you have two competing planes flying opposite directions towards each other, but before you get ideas that this is some kind of elaborate mid-air game of chicken or jousting, it's not that exciting. You play the game just by tapping a single button and have no control over the flight of your aircraft. When you tap the button, your plane drops a bomb and destroys bricks down below to score points. Whoever destroys the most bricks wins, and in one sense you could see the game as an upside down game of breakout. The only slight element of skill involved is that you have to time when you drop your bombs to hit the most bricks, and if you press the button twice in a row too quickly in succession, the first bomb you dropped will disappear before it's done all the damage it can do. Unfortunately, this isn't a very good game in this collection. Crystal Castles is one of my favourite games in the collection, however, and one I'd never heard of before booting it up on the Evercade. The game is an isometric 3D platformer of sorts, which plays similar to Pac-Man. From the box art shown on the game select screen, it would seem you play as a wizard teddy bear of some kind, which is a cool thing in itself, but the in-game sprite does look a lot more like a mouse. You do have a surprising amount of control over the character as you move around a variety of mazes and you have to collect all the pellets, or whatever they are, whilst avoiding running into a baddie. The controls for the character are really responsive and this was an addictive game to play which I really enjoyed. Feeling game with different levels to learn and villains to challenge which changes the strategy up significantly. Centipede is another of the heavy hitters here, and is another addictive space shooter in the Space Invaders mold. Of course, the idea here is that the centipede is what is coming down the screen towards you instead of aliens as found in Space Invaders or the bugs in Galaxian, but it's, it's still fairly similar. A couple of unique features of this game is that much like those rumours you heard about worms as a kid, if you shoot and cut the centipede in half, it will split into two, and then you have two shorter independent worms coming at you. I mean centipedes. You know what I mean. When you manage to shoot the individual segments of the creature, they also will turn into blocks which can then be destroyed, because if they're not, they will create a barrier of sorts, which will mean that the centipede will travel down the screen a lot faster. Lastly, unlike other games of this type, you can move your ship about a quarter of the way up the screen, which allows you to dodge baddies if they get down to your level. It's a great game and one of the highlights of the collection. Double Dunk is a two-on-two -two basketball game, but I can say straight off the bat that NBA Jam this is not. It controls okay enough, but when the players get into close proximity on the screen, it can be a bit confusing which is your player and which is the opponent. There's not a lot to the game other than that you pass the ball back and forth and can shoot at the basket, but after not long you'll, you'll feel like you've seen it all. There are a bunch of options to add variety to the game, including the length of the game being dictated by time or how many points you need to score to win. You can also play with the rules a little bit so that it's like how long you can hold the ball for without passing or shooting or whether fouls are legal or not. This game is okay for short plays here or there, but again, works mostly as filler and adds a little bit of variety to the types of game also featured on the cartridge. Desert Falcon sees you control an actual falcon, well a pixelated one anyway, rather than the name be a reference to an aircraft of any kind, and you can fly over landscapes in the desert whilst dodging villains and pyramids. This game wasn't an easy game to get into and the controls were a little bit annoying when your options are to hold up to move around slowly or to press down and go into auto flight. Pressing up again will land your bird and if anything the idea of pressing down to go up in the air and up to land just feels a little bit back to front. Food Fight is another fun game here which came out originally in 1987. And with some of the more recent games, you can definitely see how developers were progressing to make fuller concepts of their games. Each level in Food Fight takes place on a single screen, and you have to navigate the main character, Charlie Chuck, across the stage to eat an ice cream. The animation of Charlie Chuck eating an ice cream is worth the price of this cart alone. It's hilarious. 
It sounds simple enough to go across the screen, but with varied levels and villains that can even pick up and throw various lumps of food at you as weapons, just makes it a bit more of a complex game than some of the games featured on the cartridge, such as Canyon Bomber. Gravitar is a similar game to Asteroids. You control a triangle and rotate around the screen and shoot, but instead of giant meteorites to hit as you have to blast in Asteroids, you have to blast some flying saucers. The real challenge here comes in that the various stars, moons and planets dotted around the screen all have gravitational pull which will drag you in towards them and you constantly have to fight the controls to make sure that you're not pulled into them and crash land. You don't want a collision course after all. It does make the controls a little bit frustrating but you'll have fun with it once you get used to them. Next up we have Missile Command, which is another of those games which is fondly remembered by many players from the era, and has addictive gameplay which hasn't really aged that much. This game could be described as Space Invaders crossed with Buster Move, which I'm sure several of you watching and listening will think like, huh? But think about it and you'll realise I'm right. Unlike regular Space Invaders, you cannot control your ship and Instead, you fire projectiles from a central position, just like when you fire the bubbles in Buster Move. And instead of actual visible baddies on screen, you're instead shooting their bullets out of the air before the bullets can come down and hit the space invaders like blocks that are dotted along the bottom. So here we see that we've got Motorcycle. Sounds a bit like Motorcycle. Motorcycle ticks the box to have some racing variety on the cartridge, and it's a fun racer. Uh, but don't expect this to be your favourite racing game ever. The graphics are big and colourful, which is good, and whilst you do get the sense that sometimes you are just sliding across the track, you do get some nice leaning animation once you really press that button. The controls of this game also feel quite good, and even within your first couple of tries you'll feel like you're picking them up and improving as you go along. You can even make your motorbike jump, which is fun, because you can look for the perfect opportunities to pull off a great jump and catch some air. Let's see what else we've got. Next up we have Night Driver, which is pretty bad. You control a car, which is represented by what looks like a badly drawn TIE fighter from Star Wars. What is surprising though is that according to the instruction booklet, this game is supposedly in first person, which makes me wonder what the avatar is meant to be. As a contrast, the cars that you drive past actually look quite good, and everything else though looks awful. The road is only visible by the perforated lines that represent turns in the road. If you hit the side you crash and it's game over. Expect that to happen often, as when you hit the accelerate button the turns come at you so fast you really don't stand a chance. Night Driver is maybe the worst example of filler yet. Ninja Golf Time the next game on the list is Ninja Golf, and it's a game I'd heard of before getting this collection, but I had never played. It's a kind of weird idea. You're dressed like a ninja, like Sub-Zero or Scorpion from Mortal Kombat, and it's an early beat-em-up game. You start each section of a level by putting a golf ball with a club, and then you chase after it, where along the way you have to hit the ball and then fight and kill other ninjas and giant frogs, which makes sense. In fact it makes no sense, but it's yeah, it's actually quite fun to play. Now, Steeplechase will feel familiar to anyone who've played one of those horse racing mechanical games at seaside arcades. Either the big ones where you have to roll the balls into the holes to speed up your horse, or those simple ones where you put in a coin to bet on the winner. Not that this plays exactly like either of those, it just really visually looks like those games. One of the older games on the cartridge, this is a super basic game where you have to control when your horse and jockey jumps over hurdles to get the smoothest landing to keep your pace up. And that's the game. Very simple and barely what would feel like a game in its own right these days. But as a WarioWare style mini game, yeah, it's quite good. Next up we have Sword Quest Earthworld, and this didn't win me over straight away by any stretch of the imagination. I was super confused about what the objective of the game was. It feels a little bit like you're in the Lost Woods in The Legend of Zelda, where you move from one screen to the next, and it looks exactly the same. 
Now if you hit the action button on any of the screens you'll be able to see if there are any items in the room and you can choose to either pick them up or leave other items you may be carrying with you in that room. This game would have been a lot better if you could have actually seen the items in the room rather than just on the menu screen because it's really hard to keep track of how many screens you moved along and what you left where. Also, whenever you go from one screen to the next, you get what I can only describe as Resident Evil style door loading screens, where it gives a first person view of you going onto the next screen. When you're playing, every so often you'll see some random numbers flash up onto the screen, which are clues to what you must do next, and, and sometimes you'll come to a more action oriented screen, which will give you a little mini game challenge to do, like dodging through rainbows or other little dots as they move around on the screen, or one where it feels like you're playing a version of Frogger jumping across logs. It's a shame, but with a few quality of life changes, I'm sure there's a fun retro game in here somewhere that could be made, but it's just a bit too unclear what you're meant to be doing to really recommend this one. Tempest is another famous game in this collection, and if you've never played it before, you control an avatar that moves around the edge of what looks like a pair of underpants. Now, it's meant to be space with a 3D perspective, but uh, you'll only see underpants now. You're welcome. And you shoot at enemies that come towards you, Space Invaders style, except for on the 3D plane. Having checked the info for this game in the instructions, I was surprised to see that this was a prototype that was developed and never actually released. I'm sure the ROM of it has been floating around on the internet for a long time, and I'd imagine it's probably been included in other collections like this. But it's still very cool to see that the EverK is the way for previously cancelled or unreleased games to be released officially. It also makes sense that this game may not have been released though, as although it is definitely Tempest, it's by far the least impressive version of Tempest I've encountered. Coming up next we have Video Pinball, and uh, well, it's worth noting how glorious it is to play some old games that are so old that they can literally just have a descriptive name like Video Pinball or Adventure, and that the publishers thought this would be enough to distinguish the games from any other release. Oh yes, I remember this one, it's the one that's like Pinball. It's Pinball, but video. Anyway. What can be said about this? It's video pinball. The graphics are as simple as could ever be to lay out a pinball table, and you fire a ball and control the flippers as you try to stop the ball falling into a pit and ending the round. As someone who isn't an expert in pinball games, either in the real world or, or on video games, video pinball, uh, I can say that it feels a bit like pinball as I would expect it to, and the physics of the ball worked as I would hope, I guess. Yeah, video pinball. Yars Return is another game that wasn't released back in the day, and on the menu screen, it's listed as being from 2005, which actually makes it a cool 15 years newer than any other game on this release. The game is a sequel to Yars Revenge, and when I first played it, I thought my game had glitched as there was so much visual mess of flashing pixels I didn't know what was going on. Of course this is intended, but I did feel after a short while that I didn't enjoy all the garbled pixels. You control a ship and have to shoot at an enemy, uh, again of the Y-front variety, in the centre of the screen. They are protected by a variety of barriers that come in different shapes and some that move about that you can blast through as you try to shoot the enemy. The big tip here is to watch out for the spinning disc that can be sent at you at lightning fast speed and also to be just as wary of the really slow lasers that can get hidden by the garbled pixel nonsense and can easily come and shoot you. One thing that is quite cool though is that if you go through the barrier you can actually drill or eat maybe? But you can drill your way through the blockades too. It's another game which is fun to see get an official release so many years after the system was out of vogue. The final game in the collection is the 1990 Atari 7800 game Alien Brigade. This is one of the most recent games in the collection and definitely one of the most impressive. The game is actually a light gun game which obviously you'll have to play using a D-pad on the Evercade. This didn't bother me at all though as I often enjoyed playing light gun games with an on-screen cursor back in the day. 
Now the gameplay is repetitive and although it's an old game, it has everything you'd expect from a light gun shooter. So it feels a good addition to the collection in terms of variety and is a nice game that is fun to return to here and there for some mindless shooting action. The game has lots of things to shoot at, including tanks and army dudes, and also has lots of alien scum which look like giant locusts and other nasties. Occasionally there will be humans you mustn't shoot, which is an essential piece of the light gun genre as it means you have to think before you shoot. Ammo is also slightly limited, so you don't want to just constantly be holding down that fire button. Fortunately though, you can also pick up some extra ammo and have a limited number of big shells you can fire to do maximum damage. And so there you have it, the Atari Collection 1 for the Evercade is the game which comes with every system and gives you 20 classic games to get your teeth into. The highlights are definitely Centipede, Missile Command, Adventure, Alien Brigade, Crystal Castles and Food Fight. Whilst there are a few others that feel like filler, there is still plenty for any retro fan to get a lot of enjoyment out of this. It's also worth noting that both Centipede and Asteroids are represented with their 7800 versions on the Atari Collection 2 cartridge. And in one sense you can understand that they felt justified to include both this and the 2600 versions here. But with a few cases of filler in both collections as well, it may have been better to either look for an alternative title to include, or just to cut the filler and make a single really, really strong collection. I understand why they wouldn't do that as they can sell two separate collections this way, but it's still worth noting and I guess they're cheap enough releases so that we shouldn't complain too much. Whilst it may feel a little too old for some players who maybe grew up in the era of the NES or the Super Nintendo, there are lots of fun games to be had here. And it's another great collection for video game historians out there to enjoy. And so there you have it, the Atari Collection 1 for the Evercade. It's a Really good collection and with 20 games on there, some of them are, like I said, a little bit filler, but overall it's a really strong release for the machine. And I look forward to reviewing some more of the Evercade games for you in the coming weeks. So for now, head over to the Xtremes.tv website to be able to see more of our video game coverage and make sure you smash that subscribe button over on youtube.com forward slash Extreme Improv. Make sure you ding that bell and give us a like. And until next time, always stay extremed. Bye for now.